and welcome to the fourth event in the Cambridge Association of Architects Architecture Talks series, uh, which is a series of sustainability webinars held in association with the RIBA, uh, which the CAA is one of the local branches of. Uh, we kicked off the webinars earlier in the summer to follow up on issues uh, surrounding climate change and sustainability that were highlighted in the spring summer edition of the CAA's biannual journal, Cambridge Architecture. Uh, if you're interested in seeing what was in that edition um, or signing up, then uh, pop on over to cambridgearchitects.org after the webinar, uh, where you can sign up to the mailing list and see previous editions. Uh, so my name is Tom Foggin and uh, I'm here today as chair of RIBA East and a member of the RIBA East Sustainability Group and also a member of the CAA committee. So um, what I squeeze into my spare time is my actual day job as an associate at a Cambridge practice, RH Partnership Architects. Uh, this evening, the format is going to be a series of short presentations from our three speakers, followed by a panel discussion and plenty of time for Q&A with you, the audience. So we'll run through the presentations, um, but don't let that stop you submitting questions whilst speakers are talking into the Q&A panel, and we'll then answer those once the talks are over. Um, as a point of housekeeping, I, I probably should let you know that this event will be recorded uh, and we're hoping to make it available online in the near future, along with our earlier webinars that we've been running. So uh, I'm, I'm joined tonight by three speakers who are going to provide different perspectives on the theme of embodied carbon relating to their different disciplines and interests. First, we'll hear from Duncan Cox, who is Senior Associate in the Sustainability Team at Thornton Tomasetti. And Duncan was part of the working group who developed the embodied carbon primer for the London Energy Transformation Initiative, much more easily known as LETI. And he will provide an overview of the primer and perhaps also drop some hints at what else might be on the horizon of future work from LETI. Secondly, we'll hear from Anthony Cooper, who's architect and director at Balfritz and the House Designers. And he has considerable knowledge and understanding of healthy and environmentally friendly construction methods and will provide an overview of case study projects Balfritz has been working on, notably in carbon positive development using off-site timber frame construction. I'm afraid Anthony sandwiched between two engineers this evening and we'll finally hear from Mike White. Uh, Mike's a, a senior engineer at Smith & Woolwork, a Cambridge-based firm of structural and civil engineers with a wealth of experience in structural timber low carbon design and passive house projects. Mike's currently working on two student accommodation projects, including a building designed to the passive house standard with a cross laminated timber primary structure here in Cambridge. And he's also upgrading Smith & Works carbon reporting strategy. And tonight he'll be pre presenting a structural engineer's perspective on embodied carbon. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Duncan who will set the bigger picture scene for this evening's discussion. Um, thank you. I'll just let me just share my screen. Um, I assume you can see that. Yep, good stuff. Okay, so um, yes, thank you, Tom. Um, as said, I'm Duncan Cox. I'm a senior associate at Fonte Tomasetti, but um, I was uh, and still am quite active in the in the Letty world, which is, as, as said, London Energy Transformation Initiative. Um, uh, I just that's not working so let me flip through here um so what the group is if you don't know um it's a it was a group set up in uh 2017 um to do <laughs> sorry to say it says what it does on the tin but um but it but it was it was uh, to try and drive a, a transformation in the energy um london's energy uh, particularly in the built environment so it, it's it's a volunteer group um it consists of all professions, um, all sectors of our industry. So there's architects, engineers, clients, contractors, um, uh, manufacturers, um, uh, you name it, they're, they're, we have representatives there and, and everybody involved is, um, uh, is there to, is giving up their own time to try and try and help um, a sustainability agenda. Um, it's a really positive group to be involved in. It's one of the most positive, I've been involved in a few groups, but this one just uh, feels that everybody's there to, to really drive change, recognize that we, we need to make an impact on, on, on reducing the, the carbon associated to our industry amongst other things. Um, 
and said it's it's sort of slightly um sort of got an activist agenda in a way i mean uh, there are other groups that are but more activists like a can but but it's it's got that sort of common methodology um common approach to sort of reduce reduce our environmental impact for in our in our work in life um and so um it we've we've developed a framework of, of this path to zero carbon and i'm sure you've seen these through other other um groups that have sort of all talking around the, the same sort of thing and um i mean the british government's doing it but um which is which is great the last last sort of um 12 months or so there's been a real in, awareness in, in um tackling um the climate emergency we've seen the architects declare structural engineers declare other, uh, and other other declarations but these paths to get into zero carbon and 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 within letty we've been quite sort of vocal about how to do that and wanted to try and help help guide that um guide that path um uh, and what i one of the, the the things we 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 started up um doing which came out as a precursor to the guides which i'm gonna i'm gonna talk about the embodied carbon primer but um the, we we also released the climate emergency design guide at the same time which i'll, I'll touch on a little bit later but as a precursor to this we 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 sort of um we we did this net zero operational carbon one pager it was sort of our our look at how how we could get to net zero what what does it consist of we'd seen other groups such as the w uh, world green building council and um, uk gbc um and others um sort of release these guidance but but there wasn't um it was sort of telling you what we should be doing but not really how to do it so that was sort of what we thought perhaps in our professional um capacities we should be trying to come together to think about how we could actually get to get to some of these um the, these necessary targets so th so the upfront of the middle of last year was was this um the, the 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 net zero operational carbon one pager we call it and it looks at it's a lot about operational carbon um setting EUIs and and the energy supply and um uh, also embodied carbon is 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 tackled in there but it was like this sort of trying to um trying to get people to focus on on what what they needed these these different aspects of of trying to get to to zero carbon and it was supported by a number of groups such as letty were involved uk gbc and the building better better buildings partnership as well as um riba as well sibsi good homes alliance um and that that led to this um this climate emergency design guide and and the point of this guide was as i said was like not to tell people what to do but but hopefully help people uh, along that journey of, of of getting to to zero carbon and how they could do it so it it came together as this and it was released at the start of where are we this year i'm trying to think <laughs> this year has been a weird one but earlier this year we had a launch of of the of the design guide um and it was written by over 100 volunteers as i said and and real sort of um a sort of community spirit of um of of coming together to tackling this together um and within that the there were there were these five clear sort of targets of like how do we get to net zero one of them being operational energy we know about that we've been trying to do that for a while body carbon future of heat uh, demand response and data disclosure. Now, I was involved in the body because I've been involved in body carbon for a number of years with my own sort of uh, company interests and uh, research. But um, I was sort of uh, I, I joined up into the embodied carbon work stream, and we were tasked with write, writing ten pages of how how do you reduce embodied carbon? What can we tell designers what they should be thinking about? We ended up writing about one hundred and eighty. Um, <laughs> and sorry i flicked through um uh and that led to us actually we can't put this in the climate design guide we've got to um we we we, we have to write our own <laughs> sort of supplement which this document this embodied carbon primer should have said right at the start all of this is freely available it's 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 on the website you can go and download it um so what embodied carbon is is um is um I'm, why it's important particularly when we look at the whole life carbon and i'm sorry embodied carbon is 
now so common probably a lot of people have heard they know a bit more like um understanding of what it is but it's if you we consider the sort of whole life carbon is your operational carbon plus your embodied carbon um gives you that picture and so if we look at the life cycle stages this helps us understand where the embodied carbon is so in a, in a building's development if we think of some where you get those um where you get those raw materials how they're manufactured how they're transported between transported between uh factories and 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 to the to the project site and how they how they put together built on site or off site and how they're um and uh how their ongoing maintenance like if you're replacing a shading device or you're replacing um uh as um, part of the m e kit and then the deconstruction of the of that building or the or the or the recycling of the of those material elements or the or the repurposing of those uh, those elements each of those cycle those phases in that cycle has has um, an energy uh, flow associated to it. And that energy flow often um, involves the, the um, release of uh, carbon emissions into the atmosphere through, through, the, through the creation of that energy. And that's what we um, embodied carbon, it's sort of the carbon embodied within those, those materials. The operational carbon and, um, would come from how your building functions, um, turning on the lights, turning on the heating, and 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 that sort of day-to-day -day use, and that's sort of the yeah the operational phase. Um, but the but and and if you think for for a no, quite a number of years now, we've been regulating on operational carbon. Um, there there is uh, there's sort of planning requirements of of your targets, what you should hit. There's also it's also impactful on your energy bills, etc. Um, uh, so it's been something, and, and it's been focused in the industry that to 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 reduce the carbon emissions associated to our buildings, we 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 think about those how it operates. But we we haven't really thought too much about the embodied for a number of years, and, and thankfully that's changing, which um, which is about time. But um, but um, it's it's still not regulated, and 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 it's and it makes up quite a big portion um so when you think about those cycles i was talking about if we have here like a day zero when you completed your building you delivered it to site there's a there's a big carbon footprint associated to that building and then as as we as we go on year on year on year you'll have operational emissions associated to it from you from as i said from turning on the lights every day there's, there's going to be carbon associated to that if you're on a carbon grid um and then replacement periods of those materials again injects embodied carbon back into the building so if your windows are on like a 20-year replacement um uh sort of cycle then every 20 years you're going to get a carb embodied carbon uplift into that building and that's what that's where where we have to think about these um where these carbon flows are in the building um and so what we've done in Letty um, is because uh, they're there and, and regulation does seem to be coming finally, which is good. Um, it's been involved with a number of different local authorities that are starting to implement that this. But what what we were always asked, um, what people I know, as I said, I've been involved in this for 10 years, but people always want to know numbers. They're obsessed by numbers. Um, and so we we set targets. We were saying if 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 we get to this sort of we need to get to a zero budget. Um, these are the targets we need to be hitting um, in terms of the embodied carbon and uh, at what is it today, what it should be. 2020, we, we wrote this last year. So this is sort of best practice. And then we're also the uh, 2030 target and then a whole life sort of net zero target. But we were, we were mixing it by different building archetypes. Um, and this came from a sort of background review of data the number of us collected and talking to different LCA providers, um, and I'll be honest, the the the, the numbers have we've had different um, different responses to these numbers. Some people say they're far too high. Some people say they're too low. Um, my personal point of view, and sorry, I try not to go on too much, but. Um, it, it's about engagement. If if people are starting to suddenly ask me the question, well, this number doesn't make sense, then at least they're they're, they're thinking about the carbon in their building. So that's sort of a 
it's like wait we've got somewhere where they're, they're engaging with embodied carbon in their building so that was that was a, a, a win for me um but yeah so we in the in the design guide we'd set eui targets for the energy use but the point in the primer was to start setting targets for the embodied carbon and What's, what's particularly important when you start to think about the, these these trajectories, we the 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 design guide which we set, we we set pretty stringent EUIs, and and when you look at some of the different um, uh, methodologies for to reducing your operational um, demand on the on a building such as passive house, which you can get significant reductions um, in um, in your operational carbon. And so, as we as as these efficiency measures are coming in place, and, and they're really being pushed, and non -rec not so much recognition on the embodied side of stuff, we're um, seeing that where we always used to have um, a typical sort of building compliant building. Now, if we look at it, uh, the one on the left here would have I keep looking at the wrong screen. Um, We'd have the yellow would be our operational carbon. That's a building reg compliant building today. So 70%-ish would be associated to your operational. And the pinks here, that this is upfront embodied carbon and then transportation and recurring carbon. If we go for an ultra low energy building, such as a passive house, for example, um, our, the, the pie totally changes. We can have significant reductions on our operational and then our embodied carbon takes up a biggest, bigger percentage um, and there's more responsibility for us to think about those reductions. Um, uh, and, and it sort of shifts some of the focus and it's good that Mike's going to talk here because a lot of the focus is going <laughs> to go on to his, his, um, his, his sort of stream. We've got, if you look at, tip, this is for, we, we look at different archetypes in the, in the primer, but for a, a, a a residential building and this is typical you find sort of 70 50 to 70 percent would be associated to your structure in terms of the embodied carbon and then your the the rest of the the the, the other 50 30 percent is associated to your enclosure and your internal elements and and i think these mep kits are still still learning a bit about about how much embodied carbon is really in this um i've seen figures up to sort of 15 percent but there is a lot in the structure, um, and uh, what well, I was going to say, I just wanting to jump back to this. When we when we think of what, but what's important is that if if we look at our ultra low, low energy building, we're going to have if if half of this sort of pink is associated to the structural engineers. And we still got half that's associated to the building enclosure and the um and 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 the and the kit and 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 the internal partitions and it's kind of those material elements that that would feature as your your recurring energy um, elements that they're, they're the they're the elements that would be replaced so it's particularly important when we look at these life cycle of missions of every sort of 15 20 20 years um, we have these uplift and this is going to be will be associated to your building enclosure your glazing your 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 the architecture internally the 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 the, the services and so there's there's different ways of looking at where 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 I think Mike will be looking very much as, as the sort of upfront carbon at times. I think there's a responsibility on the architectural side to really consider this ongoing. They they have a big impact on this ongoing um, uh, carbon. Um, sorry, I'm just getting a little bit sidetracked. Um, but the because uh, I've only got a couple of minutes. Um, but what we've done in the guide is, um, uh, which I encourage you to have a look at, is uh, to to go through each of the the reba stages and and say how you can make impacts on reducing your embodied carbon like whether it's a early stage concept stage framing analysis like bay analysis vertical horizontal grid um to later stages when you're really looking at procurement where you're where you're looking at where you're sourcing materials from and and whether you can make um make those sort of reductions at, at it's more targeted reduction so you start big and then and then you then you start to 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 really try and um uh, target those those reductions uh the guide tells you how to measure there's a lot of and one of the purposes as a guide was to demystify the process if you talk to an lca specialist they will 
often bamboozle you with stages and standards and and uh, talking what feels like code but it's a quite easy practice to do these 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 takeoffs it's a simple coefficient times material quantity volume um <laughs> sorry to, it, it can lca analysis can be so much more in depth I'll, I'll put it up but you can get a nice ballpark figure if you do some of these sort of easier takeoffs um and they, the guy sort of shows you how to do that it also talks about rules of thumb, what you can think about on your site. Um, for example, there's a whole host of different rules of thumb we have in there that, um, that, that where you could be thinking about and maybe how you talk to your client and stuff like that. Um, um, and then we've also gone through each of the materials as well. So there's aluminium, but there's still concrete, um, how you can, uh, what the considerations should be, maybe how you specify where there's good case studies of it. Um, pointing you in direction of some further reading, et cetera. Um, and it's, it, we, we've, we've looked at that for all different materials um, um, uh, that, that, that you'd find in your building. So it, it is really there as like, a, it's, not, it's not telling you follow this process, this is how you do it. It's like, it's giving, it's, it's, it, as I said, it's demystifying, but also giving good guidance to, to help designers to, to, to make those steps to, to make reductions. Um, the next steps, and, and so Letty is like, it is London, but we are, I, I'm, I, there's been talk a lot about um, uh, spreading this out, or, or, and there's been interest from um, other, other regions of do a do we drop the London from the title because stuff applies elsewhere but um but I know other sort of cities and, and areas have been interested in and in forming their own groups because I think the groups is the powerful bit the the way you're working together it's that sort of as I said it's a it's a real collaborative approach and and, and if, it sort of gets past all the politics and people are doing it for the right reasons um but we're also so there are talking about going like spreading it around and seeing groups elsewhere but we're also very conscious of um of our next step is influencing policy so trying to get some of this into regulation um uh, so that it that 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 people ha will have to start uh, like body carbon is regulated um and then also procurement is a is a is a stream and it's a stream i'm closely involved in it so we've sort of shown this is how you could make reductions but our next step is we could we can as designers you can you can you can do calculations or you want showing we've got it down this amount but is the reality that's delivered on site often it isn't and and we're trying to understand the barriers to that so we're trying to work a bit more closely with um with people down the supply chain so that we can ensure delivery of these these low carbon buildings um, there's also a Letty Pioneer project, so we're looking for just examples of good projects. If people have like, we 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 did an excellent bit of work on this. Um, we really managed to get down um, that body carbon, and then we can sort of put that as a pioneer project. There are a lot of work streams. As I said, the one I'm I'm leading this year is specification and procurement, but there are in circular economy and all sorts of things. But uh, and people are welcome to get in touch because um, uh, we we're always looking for volunteers and, and 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 people with expertise or if people just want to do some graphics that kind of stuff sorry if i ever run but thank you thanks very much duncan so anthony over to you okay. are you able to share your slides okay so here we go so um, just as a way of introduction, um, my name's Anthony Cooper. A few of you may or may not know who I am, but um, I've been involved in architecture um, for 20 plus years in Cambridge, in and around Cambridge, I suppose. Um, although I'm currently speaking to you from Winchester, which is a, a slight way away. So um, just a quick, um, rundown on who Balfritz are. As I say, I'm a director of actually the house designers and not of Balfritz, but I started speaking to Balfritz oh, over 12, 13 years ago. And um, my colleague, um, Oliver and I um, went to speak to them and we got them to come to the UK basically. So I'd like to think I'm a founding member. That sounds a bit grand perhaps, but um, I am now the director of the house designers and um, 
I'm going to tell you a little bit about Barford's only because it's important to this whole um, embodied carbon um, topic. Um, Barfords are a family-run uh, business. Fritz is the family, Bau being build, as I'm sure you all know. So it's build Fritz, basically. <laughs> um, and um, this is important because this is, a, this is a, a family that's been going for, well, the company's been going for over 120 years now. And Dagmar Fritz, who runs the company, um, She's, it was her great, great grandfather who started the company as it is today as a, uh, he was a carpenter and um, building little gar garden shacks basically, um, which is quite poignant in this COVID time. But 1896 was founded now. I've put a few of these silly um, points just to show you how long ago that was. Well, in 1896, Funnily enough, that was the first study of this um, sensitivity of global climate to the atmospheric carbon dioxide is published. Well, I'm not going to read it all, don't worry. Um, but that's quite important. And that's just by pure coincidence um, where we've ended up. Because um, that's obviously looking exactly what we're looking at, carbon in the air, carbonic acid, as they call it. Um, another few little um, points there, Cecil. John Rhodes resigns of, as Prime Minister of the Cape of Good Hope, good riddance. Um, uh, the first Olympics were held, the modern Olympics were held in Athens and um, close your eyes, Oxford won the boat race that year. Um, so the history of Bar Fritz. Here's uh, a picture from a few years ago of the family Fritz based in Urkheim. Urkheim is where we are still based. Um, and I'm gonna show the next slide is of our director's house where she grew up. Dagmar grew up in this little house in the 70s and 80s in Erkheim. Now it's just a house, absolutely, but Dagmar's mother got cancer and that was in the late 70s and her husband, Dagmar's father, believed it was the materials in that house that caused the cancer. Slightly off to topic yet, but what that is, we often speak about disruptors now in in in, um, in business, and this perhaps was the disruptor in this business. They were building family homes, but um, Dagmar's father firmly believed this. It was the materials. It was the health of the materials, and this changed his his kind of out view, outlook on on how he was going to run his business. Uh, he was going to look at things like the health of the business, of the materials, where the materials were sourced, and basically went into every single detail he could possibly uh, find. Um, this is Barfritz today. So he's grown it from a small little family business into something where we're building between 100 and 140 houses throughout Europe annually. Um, if you look carefully on the screen, you'll see uh, a lot of solar panels. I'm only pointing that out is because with all those solar panels, this still doesn't cover what energy we need to run that factory. But what they've done, which is interesting, um, is that each employee can actually purchase one of those panels and gets money back every month from the energy produced by the panel in their pay packet. So that's just a little insight on how the family Fritz run their business. Uh, this is Bar Fritz today. This is just one of our show houses. And it's just to show you that with wood and timber and offsite manufacture, dare I say design and build, this is design and build. You can start looking at some quite interesting designs. Um, and so that's our show home in Bavaria today. Okay, so I'm going to go through this in much detail. Um, we've already said what embodied carbon is, um, and that's, as we said, is the carbon footprint of the material. Um, feel free to read through that, but what's to pick up here is the cradle to cradle, cradle to grave, cradle to site. These are kind of terms that are banded around and are very um, pertinent to this discussion. 
Um, Duncan very usefully spoke about operational emissions, which I've grayed out at the bottom there. Um, and I'll touch on that later, but not in too much detail. Um, but if I just go to the next slide, cradle to cradle, bar for instance, we're full of um, what we call building biologists and every single product in our manufacture is looked at and it is looked at to see if there's any nasties in the material. Um, so for mild hides and, and, and the like. Um, so we're not only looking at a kind of an embodied, well, a carbon positive house as we like to call it, but we're also looking at the health of the building. And what's wonderful about when we're looking at embodied carbon, the um, unintended, uh, unintended consequence of that is um, a healthy home, bizarrely. Um, and this, the next slide I'll show you is um, a kind of a certification that we've got on our, this is just on our insulation. Um, and our insulation is actually wood shavings that we, sh we kind of vacuum up off our, our factory floor. Um, and we soak them in whey from the local factory, the dairy factory next door. Um, and that gives us the fire retardant. Um, and then um, we soak them in thereafter in sodium, which makes it fire, well, not fireproof. Um, how can I say, uh, bacteria is not gonna grow on it um, <laughs> for want of a, a better expression. But anyway, so that, that just going back. So, so the unintended consequences of going down this uh, low carbon, or as we say, the carbon positive route is, uh, is the healthy building. Um, but we've, we've gone for this cradle to cradle certification um, only to show our clients exactly what's in there and um, our credentials um, as certified by somebody other than ourselves. We can tell you anything, but there it is um, from the cradle to cradle um, company. So uh, let me just come, come on to the next bit. Uh, I'm just going to quickly speak about the manufacturing process because that also speaks about um, quality, it speaks about time, it speaks about how far uh, materials have to travel um, when, when you're building. Uh, building. So, so that, 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 that's really important in, in, in this whole debate um, is the, in, the embodied you know, carbon in, is, is also affected by how far you have to travel <laughs> when bringing in all these raw materials. And what's wonderful about manufacturing in Balfritz is we've got lots of spruce forests right next door. So there's some of our uh, lovely new, <laughs> new tree and our, our spruce, spruce forests that some are owned by Balfritz, some are um, owned by local farmers, but that's where we get most of our timber from very close to the factory and that's really, really important. Uh, there's some nice logs of spruce to show you. And what happens is we, we take them into the factory. They are kiln dried um, to prevent warping and, and whatnot. But um, this is inside our factory and this is a typical wall. And you'll see that there's compartments in there. And what we do is we fill those compartment, compartments up with um, wood shavings. And that's our insulation. So not only is the wall made of timber, not only is the roof made of timber, uh, the insulation is made of timber. Um, and here's a nice inspirational picture of, of that, that wood shaving. It's, it's um, as I say, soaked in, in soda and, and whey, so it's not going to um, burn, or as I say, uh, you know, it, it's, it's going to be healthy. Um, but what's also important to see is uh, that's some of the timber in our factory. The wood is glued there in, in this instance. They're all, the glue is natural. There's as minimal um, intervention in terms of aluminium or metal components. Most of our, our um, joints are, are dovetail joints. So, so you know, it, it's kind of looking at, at, at the whole um, how much timber can we use? Um, looking back in, uh, to the past, traditional joinery, we still use that today. You know, nailing wood together, uh, that's fine. But, you know, actually, we've got old, you know, centuries old um, traditions that, that tell us exactly how 
we can build a building. Where Barford's has been different is instead of using a, a hammer and a chisel to kind of do this, we use machines to do it. So instead of you know knocking out ten houses a year, we be doing you know ten times that, and that's what technology has allowed us to do. We still have the same amount of employees, so that's in terms of being an ethical company, that's great. But we've just as a result, been able to kind of increase the output. Um, now, what's also important about this photo is there's no fire retardant on that wood whatsoever. And that's, we, we've had certified actually here in, in, um, in the UK. So there's no problems because of the, the size and the sections about fire spread. We don't have to kind of paint with horrible nasty. Uh, fire retardants, it's the sections are big enough to allow um, for us to, dare I say, get away with it. It's not get away with it, um, but um, to comply with regulations. Um, here's a, a, a typical image of, of, the, of our kind of wall. Now, um, earlier it was, it was mentioned about uh, um, passive house and, and we kind of strongly argue that passive house is not necessarily appropriate for the UK. Um, where it is in, in Germany, for instance. But what's interesting here is you can see that insulation within the wall, all the materials used. There is some aluminium for our windows, there's some, some glass that's un inevitable. I'll come on to that in a bit. But um, the only thing that's really interesting here is the cladding. That, that cladding is actually not spruce, it's larch, and it's a slow growing, growing larch from. from um, uh, the Arctic regions uh, slower growing; it will last longer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so that we we kind of only looked at the external cladding. To um, how can I say, in terms of the slow growing, the quality it's it's going to last longer. So that that's been important um, in in the makeup of the of the wall. The the gypsum we have gypsum walls, but that gypsum is specifically made for us, and if you got an eagle eye, you'll see a, a brown, sorry, a brown, a blue paper backing to one of the, um, the gypsum, um, kind of, well, um, in, internal linings. And that is actually a carbon shield. And that carbon shield kind of goes throughout the, the building, in the ceiling, around the walls, um, in the, um, the, the frames. And that's actually earth. And that's, that's like what we call an elect electrosmog. Um, shield that kind of takes out something like 99 point something percent of your mobile phone signal and your mobile phone mobile phone will actually work perfectly within that building but that's another subject so I've spoken about process I'm not going to look at this too much but this is some some pics about you know this is how Barfoot's delivered to site and the construction will put up a house typically in two or three days and we'll be offside within two weeks unless we're doing the, the whole fit out. But um, I'm going to use a word here that you're all going to shiver at. I'm going to call it a product. Um, and I'm calling it a product because that's exactly what it is. Um, the Barford's product, we're looking at design and build. Oh, there's another horrible word that architects hate, but that's what it is. And um, in this kind of time of, of off-site manufacture, I think design and build is, is the way to go. And, and it is about how you kind of deal with that, that whole design and build contract. But um, what I want to show you here is a couple of projects briefly. And before we put any house in for planning, we will give you a cost of your house to the penny or the euro cents, depending. On, on how you want your house costed. And we'll also give you uh, the carbon store figure of the, of the house, the, the frame, both gross and net. And this, is, this comes back to what we, we're speaking about today. And that, that's the um, embodied carbon in the house. And we do that before we all submit for planning. Now, here's a, a house we've done in Cambridge, which we call the tree house in St. Barnabas Road. Um, and this, this house, um, I think it's been up for three years now, I think. Um, this is the offer. This is the front page of our offer to the client. You don't have to read all of that. What's important is this house is 
um, 48 tons gross and 30 tons um, net carbon, what we call carbon positive. And we don't just say that that is, is um, audited by EMAS and she has a little, if you don't know who EMAS are, um, they, the European Union's eco management and audit system. Um, so it is an independent uh, verification. So coming back to this uh, slide, we kind of, we are telling the client not only how much your house is going to cost, we, we are saying this is how good it is, this is how good it is for the environment. It's, it's a carbon store. Um, th this is good for a, a few reasons, um, and I will come back to that in a minute, but just to kind of look at what, it, what a ton is, because Duncan spoke about figures, and we all like figures, but a, a, a ton of carbon is, and there's a few interesting bits, you know, average emission of one passenger on a return flight from Paris to New York, or driving your car for 6,000 kilometers. Um, so, I don't know, maybe that's every year you're looking at about two tons your car is, is, is kind of, um, emitting in terms of carbon, that's a diesel car in this case. Um, we can also see in, uh, the UK is 36th in the world for its CO2 emissions and we as um, the residents of the UK, we are very good, or should I say not very good, um, we emit on average 8.34 tonnes and once again to put that in perspective, um, you know, uh, if doing it in terms of a, a calendar, if you're sitting in Rwanda, I said it takes somebody in the UK just five days to emit that same amount of carbon as somebody in Rwanda. And that's scary. So 5th of January, we've kind of used up the same amount of carbon as somebody would in Rwanda. Um, so that's a pretty scary um, statistic there. So. So this is our offer. This is the, the, the front page, as I said, and it, we also go through what the EMAS eco-management scheme kind of calculates, and that is looking at kilometers traveled by the company vehicles, cranes, shipping, all of those things. Um, so it is a, quite a co comprehensive um, calculation. Now, I, you know, we're not looking at the windows, we're not looking at the, the installed kitchen or the, the tiles put down, but once again, I'll come back to that in a second. So this, this is a few um, images of the tree house, as we, we call it, in, in Cambridge. Um, our partner house designers, uh, Nielsen Flugfelder, were the designers on this particular uh, project. Um, and Anthony, some details. Uh, of sorry that. to butt and in, Anthony, yes. probably only got a couple more minutes. Just okay, keep, yeah. Try and um, give time. yeah. I'm almost there. So yeah, and this was the, the bit I was saying about the uh, operational emissions. We also look at the air pressure ratings and the EPC ratings of that house. And as you can see, they, they're pretty good just for um, ex another example. We worked with Arabs um, architects on a house in Hampshire. And this is just to show you what we're looking at for this one single project, we're looking at over 400 tons net of a carbon store. Okay, and some more images as of that project to show you that design build doesn't necessarily need to be <laughs> as what we all think design and build, um, how can I say, is, is we don't have to compromise on quality. We work very closely with Arabs here. Every single detail of that facade, for instance, is detailed by Arabs. So um, I think as a company, uh, Balfords are very serious about the eco um, kind of rating of their houses, but also really, really important is um, how healthy the building is. And we actually even certified as uh, allergy free houses, which is also a, a quite an interesting aspect of of what we do. So that's, that's it. There, there I am. I'm, I'm, I'm done. So. <laughs>
Super. Thank you very much for that. That was really, that was really very interesting. Thanks, Anthony. Um, Mike, are you happy to give your perspective as a structural engineer? Absolutely. You see that? Great. Um, so yes, yeah, Tom said, I'll try and give you a, a glimpse into the mind of a structural engineer when we're talking about embodied carbon. Um, so I've split this roughly into three parts. So some sort of background on the kind of stuff that we will look at on the structural side. And I'll, I'll mention timber and then we'll also do a sort of more specific case study um, of a project we've worked on. So similar to what Anthony was saying at the end there, just to try and sort of, you know, why is this important? Um, this shows the kind of impact you can have making a 20% structural carbon reduction in a building. And the kind of, you know, this is for an engineer or as engineers, the sort of impact we can have. I would actually say that all the other stuff at home, you're cutting meat and dairy from your diet, all that stuff is really important. Um, it, more than the numbers of it, I think it changes the mindset and doing that stuff day to day reinforces the whole kind of philosophy behind trying to be more, live more sustainably. So I definitely wouldn't say that the other, the smaller points there aren't important, but ultimately if we can make an impact in our professional lives, it's going to have a much you know, huge impact, uh, which is really important. Fortunately, it's been a really good year for the release of guidance documents to help us do this professionally. Um, certainly, I mean, the Letty guidance that Duncan talked about is a superb bit of guidance. It's, it must be the best, if not you know, second best um, document out there at the moment um, to try and help with this from certainly from the structural engineer's perspective. So I'd strongly encourage everyone to go and read that. Um, also what's come out this year is the iStructD released plan of work 2020, which aligns with the ROBA plan of work. And one of the things that's really good in this for the engineers is that it encourages us to specifically look at sustainability. And I mean, you can see the right hand box there for stage four, you know, suggests that we, as engineers, we should be providing structural sustainability reports. And uh, I know a few engineers have snuck into this call, um, but I'm assuming it's mainly architects has really just put this in here to, to make the point that you know, everyone is well within their, their rights to expect an engineer to produce something on sustainability of their structures at the ROBA stages or you know, whenever. Uh, so it really must be factored into our thinking. But the ISRCT have kind of identified that they can't just release a plan of work and expect people to talk about sustainability without some help and some backup. Um, stuff like the Letty's guidance is great and to kind of try and speak the same language, the ISRCT have also released a guide called How to Calculate Embodied Carbon. And again, this has come out this year. It's really good pragmatic guide. So the tools are starting to become available for engineers to quantify the embodied carbon in their buildings. And so, so similarly to what Duncan talked about earlier was the, so the sort of stages and the life cycle and with embodied carbon, we're looking at these early stages, so stages A1 to A5. And actually for a lot of it, we're talking about A1 to A3, but A4 and A5 are important and I'll, I'll mention that in a bit more detail later. Um, but ultimately we're looking at these early stages. So this is cradle to site or cradle to completion. So this is the energy it takes to get your materials produced, manufactured onto site and in place. And the, when your client gets given the key at the end, that's the embodied carbon up to that point. And the reason that we focus on this um, as engineers, I mean, so operational is really important, but it's more the mechanical side and the electrical side. We focus on these early stages, which is partly to do with urgency. So the climate emergency is an urgent problem. And we are approaching a series of tipping points where actually the impact we have in the next five years will set what happens in the next 20 and beyond. And so it's all very well trying to uh, crystal ball gaze and try and make the, some, a building that is having a really good impact in 30 years time, but that's not dealing with the problem now. And there is this real urgency. So it has to be considered holistically and you have to consider the wider picture, but 
the embodied carbon we're looking at those early stages and the other part of that is certainty whereas ultimately as i say crystal wall gazing you know looking at what's going to happen at the end of life of that building 60 years time might be 100 years time legislation probably be different the economics around demolishing or reuse dismantling a building is going to be different very hard to predict whereas if we deal with these early stages we have much better certainty over what the figures are what the climate or what the carbon cost of those materials is all that sort of thing and so so following on from that so the the guide has a suggested hierarchy for carbon emissions i won't go into much detail on this but ultimately build nothing um so we need to try and do ourselves all out of jobs um build less build clever and build efficiency and, and that is the hierarchy and build nothing is you know we shouldn't be building stuff needlessly but ultimately we're probably in most cases looking at the um the lower three of those boxes and some of the the bits where i think there are real opportunities by getting engineers involved early are things like justifying existing structures through analysis and surveying so existing structures can be a really good opportunity for the environment for the client architecturally um, and in engineering terms but they can be very difficult to quantify and work with uh, it can take time to do analysis and to get record information stuff so i think getting engineers involved really early can be really beneficial for that and get get that process started early so you can identify if there are opportunities there and also um, in build clever so again with early involvement things like structural grids spans and transfer structures this is stuff that can get set really early on and can have a very real impact on the amount of material going into that building and the efficiency of the structure so it's again that early involvement of the engineers uh, can really make sure that from those earliest points you're working in the right direction with the right set of decisions being made behind you um this is again so in the guide just to try and sort of set out the kind of parts of a building the engineer will be might likely to look at for embodied carbon calculations um really just to give an idea because again if we're going to start quantifying the embodied carbon of our buildings we want to make sure that we're doing it with the different disciplines picking up the parts and not leaving too many gaps uh, so this information is out there speak to engineers um, to try and make sure that you're not missing out you know there's nothing falling through the cracks of an embodied carbon calculation and then finally from the guide this one i really just included because i think it's quite interesting and it was very eye-opening when i um, saw it so this is typical waste rates for different materials so the second column there which yeah, I thought was stunning. Frankly, a waste rate of 22.5% for plasterboard, say, 20% uh, for brickwork, 20% for blockwork, 5% for mortar and screed and concrete. So this is really just saying that, you know, the waste is very real. And I think unless you've been fortunate enough to spend a lot of time on site, this is often invisible, particularly to the designers. And so it is well worth thinking about because it is, as I say, it has a real impact. So that's kind of the background um just to whiz through so timber the i'm hoping that everyone has heard in recent years about the benefits of timber and you know what anthony was saying about the, the environmental benefits and the things like environmental quality in a building timber is very good um and ultimately if we're going to meet the carbon the net zero targets we have to build in more timber and this chart shows that you know even a 10 percent increase it's not really having a big impact we need to be looking at 50 90 percent timber to actually have a real impact on the carbon emissions of the construction industry uh, so i and actually the the benefits are becoming better known uh, better quantified um so this is an analysis that we did at smith and warwick on a project to try and look at different frame options and quantify some of the benefits of the different options and basically the taller the graph is the better is the better that solution so you can see here the clt cross laminated timber came out on top um, and a lot of that is helped by things like your um, 
ECO2, ultimately your embodied carbon, but actually it gives other benefits like the air tightness. Um, so for say passive house standard or similar, um, really good for air tightness. Foundation loads, it's very easy to forget foundations and how much material there is in them because they're buried in the ground and you don't see them. Um, but they again is, have massive material quantities sometimes. So the lighter the foundation, the less material, the better your building's going to be. Um, and again, these are just some, some sketches we did of some options appraisals on a project and some of the other sort of less obvious benefits of things like CLT. So the bottom line there, the installation rate, 250 to 300 meters squared of floor area installed a week for CLT, whereas it's only half that for load bearing masonry and maybe just over half that for reinforced concrete. And so again, this is great for clients, particularly if you're working in live sites, for example, then you've got less disruption from shorter, uh, shorter construction periods and fewer deliveries, there's less traffic. And ultimately the contractor's going to be on site for less time, which is good. I mean, they get more work, they can do more projects in a year and it's, it's a more efficient way to build. Um, and again, so Timbers, so this is an analysis from project that we've done. And there's, there's a lot of debate around sequestration of timber, which I won't go into, but ultimately it's a carbon sink. You know, you're storing carbon in this building and very quickly in a timber frame building, you start to get to um, net negative net CO2 emissions. So you're storing more timber than you're um, generating by building that building. Having said all that, timber's not always the right answer, and we should be aware of that, that there are times when technically it is not the right solution for that building type. Um, so similar appraisal here from another project where some of the different materials came out on top. And so this kind of leads me into a case study that, of a project that we've worked on, which was not a timber building. So it's an environmental case study that's not a timber building, which is I thought quite an interesting one to include here. So this is a multi-storey concrete frame building with a two-storey basement. Um, it's a two-storey car park, um, everyone shudders, but it's actually removing car park from across the site to allow the above ground car parks to be landscaped. And the pole building is designed to allow that car park to be converted into other uses in the future. So hopefully by putting all the cars underground and gradually phasing them out we're actually having a net benefit um but one of the issues we had with this so this project's in cambridge and we're digging two stories into the clay in cambridge and we have an issue with ground heave and so i'm sure many of you have come across ground heave so there this is ground heave due to digging out the material on top of the clay at depth so this is not the, not the same as uh, building next to trees. It's a similar process, but a subtly different um, end product. So with this, basically what you do, you dig a hole, and because you're taking all the weight out of the hole, the ground underneath, which was previously being held down by the weight of soil on top, that gets relieved and the ground starts to lift up and you get movement at the bottom of your excavation. And traditionally, this would be dealt with by piling the building, and so you'd have piles, pile caps, and a suspended slab with a heave protection like your core deck or your peak avoid underneath the slab to allow the ground to swell underneath the building. And the building sort of just sits there quite happily, not really knowing what's going on un un underneath. And we looked at this on this project and we went, well, that's an awful lot of concrete. Um, you've got piling, you're trying to pile in the bottom of a two metre basement. It's a lot of work. There's a lot of cost and you're just putting concrete into the ground. And it's this thing of actually the amount of material in the substructure can be enormous. And we quantified this and those 1100 meters cubed of concrete going into the substructure. And so we looked at this, thought there must be a better way, surely. What happens if we just do a raft? We do a flexible foundation that will move with the clay. What happens if we do that? And what are the benefits? And so we did a load of analysis on what happens when you dig the heave, the clay out and the heaves. You try and we start to estimate deflections and how how the building is going to move over time, what the scale of those movements are going to be, 
and ultimately are they going to affect the finished product and we decided that actually it was all within acceptable boundaries there was about i think 25 mil movement at the bottom of this excavation and we did an appraisal of the masonry facades and thought actually this is all going to work this looks good so it's worth taking forward so we put some more numbers to it and you see there at the bottom right you've got 825 meters cubed of concrete for this foundation solution so just by sort of questioning the status quo and doing a bit more design work and some pretty sort of intense thinking we saved 275 concrete 275 tons of concrete and this was at roba stage two so very early on you know we made a, a decision that made a huge saving going forwards um albeit it took a bit more work but because we were involved early on we had time to do that and make this saving having done that some finer tweaks um on the concrete mix so we managed to use a high content of gra uh, ground granulated blast furnace slag which is a basically a cement replacement and is much more environmentally friendly because it's a byproduct of steel production um, and by doing this we've gone up to a combination of different floors of 50 percent or 70 70 percent ggbs and so again compared to your industry average um, of 30 percent we're saving another 200 to 400 tons of co2 um, emitted from that from manufacturing that concrete so we've saved 275 tons of concrete up front with the foundation solution and then by looking at the detail with the concrete mix we're saving more um, carbon with the ggbs and then finally just to wrap up um, hopefully that's shown that there is stuff that can be done and particularly getting involved in the early stages uh, is really critical the thing that often goes with that is when you're involved in the early stages there can be a lot of uncertainty over what you're doing and quantifying things can be very hard but the key thing with all of this is and this is straight out of the ice truck d guide is do not be deterred from trying to quantify the embodied carbon at the early st design stages just because of the uncertainty and I think there's a real there's a key point there that the it's not about what the actual number is it's about making the right decisions so that you get that number as low as you reasonably can um so yeah hopefully that's all made sense and i don't know whether i've managed to claw any time back tom but there we go that's brilliant thank you very much mike oh well thank you um all three speakers for uh some really interesting insights. I'm going to go to gallery view now, so hopefully we can see each other a bit clearer. Um, yeah, thank you to Duncan uh, for a summary of Letty's research and, and information that you're pushing out there. That's really positive to hear. And obviously, one of the big takeaways I took was that you know, as operational carbon goes down considerably, that makes embodied carbon all the more important to consider. Um, we also saw some really interesting insights from Anthony, particularly around cradle to cradle uh, and thinking about the transparency of material sourcing, which I think is something that I, I think we could all learn from. Uh, and uh, also Mike, um, talking about how the impact in the next five years is going to define what we do as a profession, as an industry for the next 20, I think that's absolutely right. And questioning the status quo, that's really very important uh, at early stages, of course. So um, we've had a few questions come in already. So I'm gonna just uh, dive into those if that's okay. Um, the first question uh, which I'm going to pick up on uh, is from Alexander Reeve saying, uh, in a post Grenfell world, might building regulations and insurers limit the use of timber structure at scale? Who wants to tackle that dicey topic? Shall I go, have a go? Um, go so this is coming up more and more and insurers particularly are getting uh, more aware of it the it's a in really interesting point in the timber industry because there is a lot of testing going on and it's trying to keep the testing and the certifications of it, the timber go timber structures going faster than insurers and building rates can kind of uh, not keep up is not the right word but to try and make sure that we have proof 
by the time we come to build. And in, particularly insurers are, they are becoming more aware of it. They are also becoming more educated about it. And often it's just a case of getting past their first one or two buildings that they insure and then they feel a lot more comfortable. Um, and so again, there are, it is well worth, it's that early engagement again and getting those early conversations with the insurers and actually having engineers in the room with the insurers to try and calm some of the fears that they might have and try and avoid a knee-jerk reaction of no we can't have timber it's flammable uh, and I also had so particularly um, CLT mass timber is very um, predictable in a fire so and there is more data coming out and there is a lot of data already so there should be more than enough ammunition to justify your buildings um, for timber buildings. Can I come, can I come in there? Um, yeah, I'm slightly tired of this question, to be quite honest. Um, and uh, when, when we, we, we started up in 2008, but we did two years of, of pre-planning before we started Barfords UK. And uh, one of the things we did, um, because we spoke to building control and they went, there's no way your facade's going to um, get through anything. Um, it's not a problem in Germany, it wasn't a problem in Austria, Switzerland, anywhere else. So we got the BRE involved in our external walls um, and did some fire testing on that, just to see if we could manage an hour. That's all they required for boundary conditions and um, our standard wall was getting two hours. That's with timber shavings as <laughs> insulation. So it's, it's, it's perception. If you look at our, our insulation, it looks like it's going to go up like tinder, because it is tinder. But it's not ready because we've soaked it in way. As I say, we've, you know, we've, we've thought about it. So I, I think um, the other thing I, in, in, in response to that, I, I think it is the Grenfell issue is really, really important. But I think in a few years' time, we're going to be able to look back with you know, sober minds um, to come with this quote calm marks a bit but um you know can you look back with sober minds and say you know actually you know it, it's it was nothing to do with timber was it <laughs> Grenfell so I'm, I'm not sure why we're looking at timber and Grenfell in in the same question really okay thank you thank you both yeah um Terry Vanna has asked asked a, a couple of similar questions um relating to cradle to cradle uh, how, how does gluing timber frame, uh, how does that square with the concept of cradle to cradle uh, and also CLT? Uh, I'm guessing that's more to do with the, the dismantling end, perhaps? Can, can, I, can I come back in there again? Sorry. Once again, um, uh, it, glue is, is, it, it takes many forms and I, I, I suspect Terry is thinking about a, a kind of a, a, a PVA type glue or something like that. You know, glue can be natural glue. <laughs> we use natural glues. Every, every single material in our products, including our laminated beams and whatnot, um, have no formaldehydes, are completely natural. There's no petrochemical um, process involved. So when it comes to cradle to cradle, cradle to grave, whatever you want to call it, um, and we've, done, we've actually done tests on this where we kind of allow our walls to kind of um, fade away dare I say, rot, and um, it become fantastic, fantastic, uh, um, how can I say, uh, feed for your plants or your garden, because there's no, there's no nasties in there. So I, I think once again, um, in, in answer to Terry's kind of, is it Terry, uh, to his question, it, it's, don't think of it as all glues are petrochemical glues, they're not. There's natural things, rubber is a natural product. You know, uh, glues can be natural. We just have to look back in the past and look, and there the solutions lie. Sure. Thanks, Anthony. Can I, can I add, Tom, actually, sorry. Yeah. Um, so just on that, something that um, we learned on, we've learned on CLT projects, that I think it's probably worth mentioning. So CLT is very, is very dismantleable. It's all held together with brackets and screws. You, know, you can just take it apart as a kit of parts. Often it can come down to everything else that goes into a building. So screed is one thing that came up on, a pro on our projects where screed can be pretty hard work to remove from a building can, you know, and 
if we're trying to make things as economic to dismantle in the future as possible, it's worth thinking through some of those other things that are going into the building. Um, so there are things like screed boards available um, that are worth, worth, definitely worth looking at to try and help with that. Super, thank you. Um, I'm going to jump to Margaret's question. Margaret Reynolds has posted a couple of questions here. Um, are, are there any suggestions for how to get timber frame to cope better with overheating uh, and uh, to add thermal mass to timber frame construction or otherwise improve the possibility of night cooling in summer? And can, I, can I once again jump in there? Yeah. <laughs> Um, thermal mass is an interesting one. Uh, residential, I would say thermal mass is, is, you need a slight bit of thermal mass in there, agree, but it's not that important in, in, in residential homes. It's more important when you come to offices, absolutely. So, um, so we, have, we have to look, when we speak about thermal mass, about, you know, the sp specifics, typically in a house you come in, you can turn the heating on if you need to or whatever. That's a quick response. In an office, you want it stable over a long time. So, so um, yeah, uh, that, that's uh, um, in response to Margaret's question, I suppose it, it comes down to um, what the building is. And um, I quite like, you know, what Mike was, was, was early saying about, you know, the car parks and, and timber isn't ideal for everything. We can't get across, you know, if we, we do a lot of basements in our buildings, we'd love to have a, a carbon neutral or, you know, carbon positive basement that don't exist, okay? And the way we look at it is a holistic way. We say, okay, our, our house might be 40 tons carbon net positive. And we offset that against, you know, the carbon, the concrete basement, for instance, or foundations are an interesting one. We do raw foundations as standards. So, you know, stuff like that. So that's once again, what Mike was saying was really interesting. Um, or we do a lot of screw piles, for instance, Yes, there's you know steel involved, but it it's minimal, you know. Um, so it's it's looking at it specific to the project and the the use of the building. That's really important. So it's a bit of a broad question, I, I think, and it needs to kind of be looked at in that kind of light. Okay, that's helpful. Thanks. Um, another question Margaret's posted, which is directed probably at Duncan, uh, is how does the Letty guide? And research deal with credits for reusing existing buildings and, and that's obviously a big issue isn't it with the existing building stock we have are there any letty publications on retrofit that'd be useful for the new retrofit coordinator training to be promoted for PAS 2035 Duncan would you like to comment <laughs> yeah so there were, I mean that was I uh, so so the guides that we've we've produced are very um I don't want to say work in progress, but they, they, they are evolving year on year. So we're updating the primer next spring. So it'll be every it'll be a year and the um, and there's publications coming out. One of the comments, because they're constantly peer reviewed. So we went through, we, we uh, took them to different um, organizations. We took them to I-Struct-T, I SIBSI, um, uh, REBA, um, asked for their comments and also for our general population and one of them was we need more on retrofit because obviously it, as we look at if you start to look at the targets of where we need to be so one of one of the things we're looking at now and i've been working with the i struck t on this is um is uh not so much um it's like what what it's top down target so what what do we need to be at what can we afford to I don't like saying afford to deliver it because it sounds like we've got a budget of how much carbon we can use each year. It'd be better to use none, surely. But um, but if we are to not get to that tipping point by 2050, then um, or or wherever you want that tipping point of where where you think we need to be, um, how much can we put within our structures? How much can we put in these different systems? And, and you start to look at uh, what those numbers mean in terms of the structure, for ex instance. And and you realise that the available materials on the market mean that we can't we can't build new. It has to uh, at one point we it has to move more into that retrofit world. We have to we must start reusing a lot more. So there's going to be a lot more focus um, on on retrofit. And yes, there's a retrofit work stream. If people want to get involved, then please contact because there's there's going to be um, there's a big effort on that at the moment to try and um, 
think about retrofit and whole life carbon and and and, and what that actually means because um yeah it's, it's that it's that question of the, like i think mike mentioned it's like it's those core core things at the start can can you do you need to build this and and i think that that question is going to come more and more if we are really to make those reductions and and yeah retrofit would be the answer um so i'd encourage her to yeah take a look um and 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 uh, sign up for the retrofit group but if she wants to contact me i can put her in touch with with who who's leading that group um no yeah just uh, on, on the retrofit thing actually in the next up, up and coming kind of uh, Cam cambridge architecture the Gazette. I've actually done a, an article exactly on this, and and it's a tricky one, really. And um, I, I think quite often on the retrofit thing is is we're stuck with what we've got, and it's not going to change because um, unless we get changes from the top, and it is legislated, and it needs to be legislated heavily, uh, we're going to be stuck with this problem forever. Actually, I think with with the buildings, bad build quality, and uh, and such like. So I. I I'm argue, arguing in that article that it, it, it that needs to be a, almost an inf infrastructure where a carbon neutral energy is, you know, used, um, and and this is about carbon footprints, not embodied energy necessarily. But um, yeah, we, we've got so so much housing up, um, housing stock out there that is so badly made, and it's not going away, and we can retrofit it, um, but actually does that really you know you can you can retrofit some houses but quite often it comes down to how much energy you use when living in that house for instance mm -hmm. and simple things like a, a, as what's one said to me a, a heavy curtain would, would reduce your energy usage but it's i don't think it's necessarily about that um i i, I i'm how can I say, I, I think it's in the retrofit sphere, I think it's more about the energy, where we get it from and how it's produced. Okay, thanks, Anthony. Um, anybody, anybody else want to chip in on that or, or we have got a couple of other questions. Um, I might move on to the next one. Emma, Emma Twine has asked, uh, it'd be interesting to know the panel's thoughts on alternatives to CLT that are more local. Um, particularly pressing perhaps with the sort of global situation we're in and more locally continental situation we're in. Um, are other alternative source approaches to CLT perhaps? Um, Mike? Yeah, um, it would be great if there were. Um, there is an amount, so there is some stuff going on in Wales and there is, you can get Scottish timber for, a lot of, for some stuff. Um, there are, it's, it comes down to supply chain largely, and also the fact that your best structural timber tends to grow in cold environments where it grows slower and it grows denser. And so you can get more out of the same product effectively. Um, timber in the UK just grows that little bit too fast or we don't have the right species planted. Um, the, I think the, the big thing on this is gonna be whether there, there is, because so, with mass timber, you have the, there is definitely an opportunity to use lower strength grades. So you could potentially use domestic timber, but the amount you would need and the size of that supply chain you would need to achieve that is no small thing. Um, so I hope that people are looking at it because it feels like there there is definitely a part to play there. Um, but whether we'll ever get away from probably mainland European timber, it's hard to see in the near future. Um, but I mean, we have been looking at it. So uh, Thetford Forest, I believe, was planted for to, um, as a timber source for buildings and building planes and things after World War Two. So we can do it. It just requires a rethink on things like strength grading. Um, I just, just wanted to add to that, if that's all right. Sorry. Um, the if you look at where your you look at your carbon budget within in these life cycles and you look at look at the benefit of the saving you could you gain from using clt for example um over some other materials 
concrete or and, and not all cases as mike said it's not one size fits all but the amount of carbon associated to that material choice compared to the amount that's associated to the transportation they don't stack up like transportation is so much smaller um typically yeah. so shipping from europe is not gonna like you're not gonna uh, the choice of locally sourcing precast planks or going over to Europe to get CLT is still going to be a better option in your carbon story to go to 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 ship it a further distance. I think there was a lot of the rating systems at the start focus, and a lot of focus was on air miles and those kind of things, and like um, uh, um, being being the bigger source local. And yeah, there's sustainability stories to that, obviously, um, economy and all that, but you 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 can you're not going to make those are the reductions that i was trying to sort of stress when when you look at how to make your reductions you start off with the big material choice elements and the frame and things like that and then you start to start to chip off a bit a bit more here and there and that would be your procurement strategy so so yeah you'd, you'd think about yeah i want timber but where yeah maybe i can i can which where am I going to source that timber from? You wouldn't you wouldn't go back and go no, but I got to ship that a long way. Um, it's 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 not gonna it's not gonna stack up. Yeah, and just we we looked at that once again. As I said, this is two thousand and six. We look we looked we looked at this um, about you know maybe setting up a factory in this country for this very reason to answer that very question and. Um, and the, the simple fact is, if, if you're in the south of, of England and your timber is coming in from the north of Scotland with um, forests that aren't necessarily planted yet, so we have to wait 20 years hard, um, there's lots of places in France that are much closer actually, and to transport them, their carbon footprint is uh, equal, perhaps even sometimes a bit less. So, uh, yeah. And, uh, and, uh, the quality yeah. of the timber is sorry. So the, 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 the quality of the timber is the main thing, and we're not going to get it here in the south of, of, of England. And uh, um, yeah, that's a huge issue. Uh, just adding on to that as well, being an island, when the, the 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 transportation impact when you're shipping something in by sea. It, it diminishes as well because your 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 material is only a small element on that on that on that big big ship <laughs> so it's got less yeah. less percentage of the 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 energy demand from that that than it would be like fr freighting on a road so that, the get into the uk is 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 the minimal impact is when it's what it's how you ship it around the uk there are car there's big cost implications but of shipping stuff around but um carbon is is it it's not doesn't take up sorry yeah okay <laughs> thank you um, so we've had two people, uh, both Margaret Reynolds and Terry Vanna have asked, um, what's the cost of 100% Portland versus G -G <laughs> GGBS? Uh, Mike, you're an expert on that. <laughs> so there's pretty much cost parity. Um, certainly industry standard in the UK at the moment is about 30% GGBS. And if you just ask for concrete from one of the big suppliers like Hanson, um, they will put 30% GGBS in that concrete anyway. Um, which is partly, is partly to do with how they balance supply and 50% GGBS pretty much the same cost and has no uh, real negative impact on site so I would argue in most cases provided it's technically the right choice um, so things like if you buried concrete in ground there are things to look at there but ultimately if it's the right you know we should be specifying 50% as a minimum when you go up to 70%, again, there's very little cost impact, but it can start to increase curing times and times for stripping formwork. And so it's great for substructures where that's not really a concern. But once you start looking at suspended slabs um, and load bear sort of serious load bear bearing elements, it can start to have an impact with how long a contractor's on site. And so there are ripple effects um, which although it's still probably the right thing to do environmentally, they will start to incur cost impacts. Super, thank you. Um, we've also had a question, another question from Emma Twine. Uh, if there are certain forms of building that cannot be carbon zero, 
should we be looking at what we build as well as how we build it? I think that comes back to one of the first points you made, wasn't it, Mike? Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, are we are going to be hitting, or we, we are at a point where we, I mean, we can't afford to build anything that we don't need to. Absolutely. Um, and I think it's going to be one as similar to what David Attenborough was saying the other week of trying to reconcile a capitalist um, society against the needs of the environment. And it's, it's going to be difficult. Vanity projects are uh, a <laughs> problem. That's on, that's on your shoulders <laughs> as architects. Uh, yeah, well, that, I think bizarrely how we started out with Balfords was in a completely different place and we've ended up mostly doing the big one-off houses, not where, where we pictured ourselves being, but mm. this is one of the conundrums we face. Yes. <laughs> No. Okay. Well, uh, I think we've got time. We're running slightly over, so we've got time for one final question uh, from Christina, who asks: uh, In relation to retrofit, it's it's really important to distinguish between traditional fabric and post nineteen nineteen construction. And retrofitting should start by fully diagnosing the existing fabric. It'd be great to develop a diagnostic toolkit. Is that something that Letty is developing? Uh... <laughs> It's good. It's good. Good on. I I honestly would have to talk to the retrofit team. I'm totally knee deep in specification and procurement. So, but um, there I'm sure there's 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 all sorts of. I, I, if as I said, if you want, if, I mean, I don't know if my contact details are available, but please, or either um, contact me or 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 there's contact on the Letty team as well to contact the people at retrofit it's not a closed shop should emphasize that but we, we welcome anybody coming in and helping us out and if from as I said like if there's there's experts in the field please come and please come and add value to it because that's what it's it, it is big big thing about it is is, is that collaboration and, and transparency and openness and just like there's the, there's no egos it's just come and help us get get to this 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 point we need to be so i don't know is the answer that was long-winded but please um i can find out <laughs> i'm sure there yeah, is I, I think a lot of it that the, the post 1990s is interesting kind of um, benchmark I, I, as i say I, 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 what we've done to to houses in the last 20 years is, is nothing short of criminal and um well more than that and the paints we use and i i, I I think we should really start about when we come to retrofitting is taking out all those plastics that we kind of wrap our, our buildings in. They can't breathe anymore. They become unhealthy. I think that's where we also need to, to really look at this in terms of the, the retrofit market. Great. Okay. Mm. Well, we're four minutes over. I've done a terrible job of chairing. Mm. Sorry. Um, but I, I would just like to say thank you to Mike to Anthony and to Duncan for your time preparing for all this and giving your time this evening to present. Uh, thank you also to everybody who's, who's asked, asked questions, got involved and come along. It's, I think, as, as Duncan, Mike, Anthony have all alluded to, it's all about engagement and getting these conversations going. So thank you all very much. Uh, if you do have any questions and you, you don't have the contact details for any of the speakers, you could always email your questions to, to well, not directly to me, but to the CAA. Uh, our email address is riba.caa at gmail.com. And if you do have any questions and felt a bit too timid to ask them tonight, then we can always forward them on and put you in touch. Uh, and in the spirit of engagement, we're always looking to try and reach out to wider industry professionals and other architects. So yeah, if there's a, a burning topic people are interested in talking about, or if people have been working on interesting projects and want to share them, we'd be happy to organise more webinars like this. Mindful that it'd be good to try and get a bit more of that sort of diverse range of speakers and topics on, on the agenda. So if you do have any suggestions, do please get in touch. Um, and just to answer that question that came in, uh, we will be making this recording available uh, in the near future, uh, hopefully through the R RIBA's um, YouTube channel and on architecture.com. So thanks everybody. Uh, it's been a blast um, and hopefully see you all in person sometime soon. Thanks very much.
Thank you, Bye sir. Now. Thanks, sir.